Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second of the best of SCJ Summit webinar series. Today, we're going to be joined by Bill Hunt from Back Azimuth and Matoko Hunt from AJPR. These are two extremely recognized and extremely accomplished SEOs in our industry. Uh, they're going to talk about preventing international SEO disasters, which if you've had to deal with any international website projects it is not as easy as you probably think it's going to be and uh, well Bill and uh, Matoko are gonna teach us a little bit about that my name is Brent Satoris and I will be moderating today and I'm gonna let Bill and Matoko uh, we'll start with Matoko give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself and then afterwards I'll get into some housekeeping points Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us today, everyone. Um, I'm Motoko Hunt. I do uh, international search market marketing consulting, mainly working with um, uh, American, uh, Canadian, European companies who need the help on um, entering the Japanese and Asian markets through the websites and then advertising digital marketing. Uh, looking forward to today's session. Thank you. And I'm Bill Hunt. Uh, I'll also be talking about uh, preventing international disasters. I deal with a lot of large companies trying to manage this on a global basis, uh, specifically focusing on the organizational side, uh, technical SEO as it applies to global, uh, with a specific focus around href language uh, and scaling. Perfect. So I'm going to jump back in just to give you a little uh, housekeeping, you know, some important notes. Um, if during this webinar you have any questions at all, any comments that you'd like to make in the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel, there is a question box down there. Please ask your questions there. We will have a Q&A session at the end where we'll answer those questions as we receive them. Uh, so please make sure you toss them in there if you have the opportunity. Throughout the presentation, we're going to do our best to uh, throw in any resources. If Bill or Motoko bring up a tool that they're using or an example site or something, we're going to do our best to toss those URLs or those references into the, uh, the chat dialog. If we miss something there, uh, please give us a question, you know, ask for it, and we'll make sure we get it in there. After the webinar, please stick around for the short survey. It's less than five minutes, and we really do review that information. Uh, we share it with the presenters, we share it with our team, and we try to improve our present our webinars from you know one after the another uh, with that feedback. So again, it's it only takes a couple minutes. Uh, it's a couple questions. We'd really appreciate you sticking around and, and giving us that information. Lastly, this entire webinar will, will be. Recorded recorded and made available as a recap post on Search Engine Journal. Typically takes a couple days, two, three days, but it will be out with the video, with the audio, with a lot of uh, notes and so forth. So make sure you check that out there. And without any further delay, I'm going to let uh, Bill and Matoko dive into their webinar. Okay, great. Thanks, Brent. And uh, welcome, everyone, to the Preventing International SEO Disasters. Motoko and I are going to tag team this. Uh, going through a lot of things we've seen, um, showing you many of these disasters and things not to do, and we'll try to give you as many tips as we go through this. Um, the three big takeaways that we want you to get from this is that one, we need to focus on the searcher. Too many times when a company goes global, they're doing it for their own benefit. They're trying to sell more because there's a, a market they see there, but they often forget about the searcher may be different. What works here in the US or works in the UK or in Japan uh, may not work in other markets. Second, a lot of these problems that we see are just people not paying attention to detail. People is a relative term. It could be your IT team. It could be uh, the people actually doing the coding, uh, could be the localization firm. So we really want to focus on and show you examples of where people haven't paid attention to detail. And lastly, it takes a village. Uh, collaborate as a team. We often see a lot of things uh, going wrong with global deployments when people aren't collaborating, when you don't talk to those. You know, in the old days before the internet, to do business in a market, you often had to go there. Now we simply put up a website, add some products to it, uh, get it indexed in Google, and we're global. Uh, and so we need to, to do a better job of working as a team with the different pieces globally. 
So we've broken this down into four common areas that cause these disasters when people start to go international. Uh, language and culture, which Motoko will talk about. Um, second, CMS infrastructure or technical issues, um, as well as geotargeting. Now, much of the geotargeting that I will talk about uh, are technical in nature, but we broke them out specifically because we're seeing more and more of these type of challenges. And then lastly, we'll circle back and talk about some of the organizational or people or collaboration side of this where we see some challenges. Um, each of these itself could be a webinar, could each be a full day session. So we've tried to call out some of those things that we're seeing most commonly, uh, as well as some fairly simple things that people seem to be doing uh, that cause them a lot of problems. So we're gonna go ahead and kick it off with Motoko and have her take us through some of the language issues that she sees and how to prevent them. Okay, so one of the first steps of creating a global website is to uh, translate and localize the website content. Um, it sounds like a simple process, but uh, we've seen some of the challenges with it. So here are some examples. And then uh, what you're looking at now is the actual uh, how to create global sites instruction on uh, eHow site. And, uh, Good example of how not to believe everything you read online. Um, it seems to be a cheap and the easy way to uh, multiply your website, but ignores uh, the grammatical uh, differences and the uh, wording differences and cultural differences completely, uh, which means that it creates more uh, problem uh, along the way and it will cost you even more to fix those problems in the future. In, uh, if the cost is an issue, uh, prioritize the languages or the countries that you want to target. And then start off from the, your tier one markets or tier one languages. You don't really have to uh, multiply your website into uh, you know hundreds of different languages and countries at once. Then um, I also understand that once you you know invest all those money and to create a different uh, version of your website, you want to uh, maximize your investment. But this is how again, how not to do example. Uh, in this case, they created uh, the bunch of different language sites targeting uh, each country thereafter. Uh, for example, you know, the, just because you have the, now have the French or Japanese website, uh, doesn't mean that you should add that to your Mexican country uh, website. You know, there's no need for the French Mexican or uh, the Japanese Mexican sites. Um, this also adds unnecessary uh, load to your servers and it create duplicate content issues uh, and then also the geotargeting issues. Um, you know, map the right language uh, and to uh, each country so that uh, you are, uh, you know, in a way, the maximizing uh, all your efforts. And then oftentimes um, people, when they localize the website, they want to go after uh, whatever the words, the translation words that has the most search volumes. And, and uh, this seems to be, uh, you know, logical in a way, but if you think about that uh, cultural differences and then some word means, could mean multiple ways. Uh, you understand that one for, you know, that always look going after the search volume is not the good way to select the right uh, word for the right content. Um, so that, especially when you are translating a European language into Asian languages or vice versa, uh, there is a huge grammatical differences and then cultural differences. Uh, so you need to, uh, you know, it's best that if you hire the native speakers or native agency who understand those differences and then able to um, pick the right word for the content you have, uh, not necessarily by the search volume. Um, 
many website owners, um, it's really interesting that they invest a lot of the money and the resources to create and optimize their uh, original or home uh, websites. But after they spend the money and uh, localize into multiple uh, the country sites or language sites, they really uh, don't keep up with the optimization. Um, this is an example of the websites that show up in the search re results with the uh, page description is pulled from the uh, header navigations. It's not a sentences. Uh, it doesn't tell people, search users, that what the page is about. Um, so, you know, it is also important that if you decide to go global, you need to be uh, willing to keep investing into each of your global sites uh, to keep optimizing, updating the content so that they will perform well too. Um, also, many sites when, uh, you know, to save the cost um, of the translation, uh, they use the module like, or the translation software like this one, uh, added to their CMS to kind of, you know, pushing out the global websites. Uh, even in English, as I said earlier, uh, the one word could have the multiple meanings and it, there's no way that you can map one translation word for one English word and then, you know, find, you know, hope for the best and it will work for the, all of the occasions and it doesn't work that way. Um, so, again, you know, this will cause, cause you more problem. You know, you might see, it seems that you are saving money at the beginning, but it will cause you more problem later on. So then on the next slide, this is the actual site I came across, uh, the Japanese site uh, owned by the, one of the American companies, um, which was created using one of those modules. Um, you know, this might be an extreme example, but just about all the words I saw on the page were wrong. Uh, it's grammatically wrong or translated using the wrong word. Uh, so sometimes investing a bit upfront uh, to do the right translation and also localization job uh, will, will save money. And then if you have the page like this, it's not likely that this page will bring you the business anyway. And so once we have this content, we need to target it to a market. Now, if you only have one version of Spanish uh, or uh, one version of English, then it becomes global. Once you start setting it for other markets, uh, most people need ways to geo-target it. Um, if you're using top-level domains like a .co.uk, that's an indicator that it's for the UK. Um, if you're using a .com, .com is essentially a global and could be anywhere. Um, one of the things we hear a lot is, well, why can't we use our language tags? Uh, and the language tags we have in the page, uh, this is an example from a fairly large company. Um, I went to their Mexico website, uh, so we can see in the header it's got a uh, slash MX for Mexico, but the language tags in the page, the language tags is saying it's in Portuguese, um, and then the actual content language is not only saying it's Portuguese, um, but it's Brazilian Portuguese. So this is one of the reasons why uh, Google specifically doesn't use these language or country tags in the metadata because about 90% of them are wrong. Um, in the upper right corner, you see that little snippet. This is one that Motoko finds pretty frequently where people use uh, for Japanese. Um, it's actually JA, not JP. So JP is a country code. Um, so JA is the language code. So these are incorrect, and we find that a lot of CMS systems, a lot of plugins have these incorrect. Um, this is an even bigger problem when people are using um, some of the localization tools or some of the href language tools inside of WordPress. Um, two things WordPress does is sometimes they're using incorrect country language codes. The second thing they do is often these country language codes, uh, in this case you see the PTBR um, is actually underscore, where hreflang uh, is a dash. 
Now, to a developer, it's a no big deal, dash hyphen, what's the, the matter? Uh, the point is that it's incorrect in terms of the syntax. So this is a very big problem that we can't always rely on the system to natively create this. Uh, and again, if the big companies aren't getting it right, uh, the, the smaller companies probably equally challenge. So again, this is a strong signal. It used to be, it could be, uh, but many of them are wrong. But probably one of the biggest things that we find is the way that SEOs do the reporting. Um, most people, for a variety of reasons, uh, they often show just the rank. So in France or in Germany or in Spain or in Peru, here is your rank report. Uh, because most people really, at the end of the day, just care about how many pages they have ranking on the first page or in the top positions of the search engine. So when you see a report like this, you don't know if the right pages are ranking in that market. Um, we often sometimes will set it geotargeting, which we'll show in a moment, incorrectly. So if you're rank, if you're only getting this type of rank report from your agency, ask them to give you the full report so you can see those reports. An example of this is is one that we do with people is, and you can do this in a simple uh, pivot table or VLOOKUP. Um, pulling in a rank report, in this case, we pulled in one from Australia. Uh, there was 216 words that they were tracking. Of the 216 words that they were tracking, 122 of them uh, actually had some page other than Australia that was the ranking page. Um, what that means is, is that if somebody comes to that page in Australia and they see it's got the, the British pound uh, and not Australian dollars, or maybe it's got the US dollar, um, they either, A, it could be deceivingly expensive, uh, or they may not be able to, uh, to actually buy from that market. Now, in many cases, they actually do have a local page, but because of duplicate content uh, and any host of reasons, it couldn't be there. So this is one of the, the big actions that I recommend you make is, and actually my, my next article for Search Engine Journal is about building a business case for creating href language, and this is one of the core things that you can do. How big is your problem with your geotargeting? Uh, and make sure that you understand what these problems uh, are. Another common one is we're using a lot of these IP detection logic tools. Um, most of the time they work, they work for major markets, but there's often fringe cases where they may not work. So one of my developers is actually in Lithuania. Uh, and he sent me this screenshot and thought it was just interesting about his experience. So he put in this particular product name. Uh, he was looking for this pack. The US site came up number one in Lithuania. Uh, they didn't have a Lithuanian site, but he's used to that. Uh, not many people in e-commerce sites are targeting that country. Um, so they often buy from the U.S. or buy from the U.K. Uh, or some other uh, you know, regional or local site. In this case, he clicked on the link, and it actually, the redirect, the IP detected him, and for whatever reason, took him to the Swiss-Italian homepage. Now, he neither speaks Swiss, Swiss or, or Italian, or is he in Switzerland? So in most cases, the tools should redirect you either to something close uh, or something default, so a global page. So clearly this wasn't working. Now being a developer, seeing the URL pattern, the first thing he did was go in and try to change um, the Swiss Italian URL to uh, a US URL he tried a UK URL, uh, and then uh, because he was changing the URL and refetching the page from the same IP, Cloudflare kicked in and actually blocked him from the site completely. So we see this a lot as well uh, with crawlers. So if crawlers start coming in from a different market, uh, let's say Google is crawling from Zurich, or maybe Yandex, instead of crawling out of Russia, crawls from, uh, from California, it's different than what may have been set. So just make sure that we're understanding what's happening when people go through these. Another example, this is the IP location uh, and content is local. So in this particular case, what was happening, the global version of this URL, if the user came to the site, which is what they wanted, to bring them to a global version, and then when they got there, look at their language or location preference, um, and then serve them uh, the local URL with the local language content. 
But what was actually happening is because the Google specifically was indexing the local URLs with these URLs, then what was happening was they were able to call them uh, back, but showing it the English page uh, in German. Uh, so it created a problem with who was seeing what. Once that was set, it didn't change until they came back and re-updated the page. Another problem we're seeing a lot is this forced country selection. Um, in this case with IKEA, you come here um, and you know you can either choose the United States or you can come in, pick, hey, I'm from somewhere other than the US. Um, this is okay, it's a great way for you to take people down the navigation. FedEx and many other big sites do this as well. But what often can happen if people don't check this is what does the search engine result show for you? So if I were to Google um, IKEA Korea or even look for IKEA in that market or any other market, we see that it's a less than optimal description. In this case for Korea, it's showing the cookie statement because that's what shows on the page. Um, the other case is this global one where it basically pulled the only text on the page. So this is a case where you want to look at uh, what is happening in the market, what does our meta description say, what does our snippet say, and how do we make sure that people are getting the right content. Another more aggressive barrier uh, that we're seeing with this is these uh, IP cookie settings. So a lot of sites have this. So this is uh, this particular site I went to. Uh, in order to do anything on the site, I had to make this choice saying, hey, we've got a cookie policy. Uh, we're seeing more and more people that are global companies have this. Um, typically, it's a ribbon bar at the top of the page. In this particular case, they didn't tell me that also once I made this choice to accept their cookies, that they would permanently set a cookie for my language preference. Now, most sites say, hey, uh, do you want to have this? also as your country language preference. When they give you that, you have the option of saying yes or no. In this case, I didn't know, and I, I said I agree to the cookie policy, and I could never get to any other country. So I tried to go to this page, the German version of the site in Germany. I also tried to go through the US via a proxy uh, tool, uh, and neither way I could get there. And because I couldn't get there, I could never see this content. Now, what if I was someone from Germany in the US and I chose this, or if I'm somebody on holiday in Germany, uh, this creates a, a pretty interesting experience. Now, when I went into incognito and didn't have a cookie preference, I could go anywhere I wanted. Uh, so this is something to make sure of is how rigid are your standards uh, and as you're doing these type of things. Another big one we're seeing with, with IP detection is that when a search engine comes to fetch, in this case, I was using Screaming Frog, uh, I set it to look like a Google uh, as my user agent. And as Google came here to get it, or in this case, Screaming Frog, it was getting the notice that it couldn't get it because the it was redirecting me. Not only did it redirect me, but it took me to the home page and I could never get the XML sitemaps. This is especially problematic if you're using href language XML sitemaps and you're detecting, say, Google or Yandex or any other search engine that's coming from another location. Uh, they don't always crawl from the United States or don't always crawl from from Russia, uh, so you have to make sure that the engines are given the access to what they want. So how do we do this? Well, one, you know, what is the default? Is simply ask that question of the technical team. What happens if we can't detect IP or language preference, or what happens in different markets? What happens if a search engine comes? Can the search engine only get to this language version of our site? What, what is that experience that they get? Um, remember, user agent detection allows the engines to get what they requested. We're not saying, oh, if it's Google, give them this page. Uh, it's not cloaking, it's actually giving them what they want. And you can use a tool called TunnelBear or any other proxy. I don't recommend using the free ones because they're not really reliable. Use one of the paid ones as a way to um, make sure you can get access and test these different markets. 
Fixing this IP blocking, this is another big thing. Fixing what is there, what is the problem that we have. Once we fix it in this particular case, uh, we fix the IP uh, detection so it could get people could get where they wanted to, the engines could get, and we also put in place HRF language. 200% uh, increase across the South American region. Uh, more importantly, 430% increase in Spain. And one of the biggest one, Peru, which is what we sort of call uh, middle alphabet markets. Um, Argentina gets a lot of love because it's the first site they typically see. Uh, in this case, Peru had an increase in traffic of 518%. Again, all we did was make sure the IP detection was correct and put in place href language. So that leads us into some of the technical challenges that we encounter. Um, one of the big ones we see a lot is when people use these multilingual single URL websites. And what I mean by that is this case here. If we go to this page uh, for ASICS Canada, they have apparel, team apparel, so basically team uh, branded uh, clothing. I clicked on the French language version. Notice the URL did not change. It did not add a slash FR or a CAFR, um, but the content did change. So everything I see is now in French. When I click the English uh, icon, the URL stays the same. So that tells me the same URL is being used for any language on the site. Um, in but what happened here is all the navigation and most of the site changed to English, but notice the body copy uh, stayed French. So to the engines, this is confusing. Which is to I do I give it to? And that's the big question you want to check. If I did this search, and again, I isolated it to a site colon just to see them. Uh, when I search for the English version of the word, I see team uniform, but even though it's English, and I'm searching from the US, I see the description in French because that's what was on the page. It doesn't magically translate it to English. When I do the same query uh, in French, um, I see that it does change the title. I do see that I see that. But again, which in this case, it does sort of do double duty, uh, but because the page is problematic, it doesn't know. So the big challenges are links can go to what to each of these. If you get a lot of links from, say, French Canada or from France, that's making that content look like more French than maybe English uh, targeting either the English-speaking part of Canada or uh, the United States. So it's this is one of the big problems. You also can't use geo-targeting because the same URL is being used in every country. So there's no way to say, hey, in this case, it's equal to Germany. In this case, it's equal to France. Uh, so that's one of the big problems that, that we encounter with these um, multilingual single URL websites. Another big one we're seeing are mixed signals. So a lot of times uh, somebody will put href language maybe in an XML sitemap to get started because it's sometimes easier. Uh, at the same time, the development team is working on a project. In this case, on the left, they put it not only in the page, but it was actually in the header. So nobody saw it. The agency didn't see that they had it. But in this case, the header is actually saying all the pages are mapped to languages whereas the XML sitemap for the exact same setting was saying it's country language. So uh, the, the search engines get confused. Which do you really mean? Because there's a big difference between assigning a page to a language and a, and a bigger difference in something being assigned to a country and language. Another one we see a lot are uppercase, lowercase. Again, and on a development standpoint, it has no value, no change. It doesn't matter, it's the same URL. But in the cases of canonicals and href language, it makes sense. So in this case, the US page, uh, uppercase US, was pointing to the canonical for the uppercase, but all the references to this page in href language were lowercase. So which one did they use? And we were finding this was causing a lot of errors, both from the canonical and the href language and being, it was confusing. So this is extremely attention to detail. You really have to make sure that all these things are set correctly. We see this a lot in our hreflang tool. We actually do error checking. We often find that people 
uh, will leave canonicals in place so they might clone in this case a Dutch site into uh, for Belgium um, and it they leave the canonical in for the Netherlands um, other things we see is they canonical it because you're now coming to a page and nobody's turned off um, the IP detection. So these type of things you definitely want to check to make sure because in this case there was you know significantly more errors on the XML sitemap than what was actually good URLs. So in this case the engines will ignore these um, these type of information completely. And a lot of this is caused because of these organizational challenges. And we're gonna turn it back over to Motoko to walk us through what some of these are and how you can uh, prevent some of these by working better with your wider team. Okay. Um, so having a global website means you need to manage multiple websites either by yourself or through your in-house team or the local agencies and as you can imagine that will create additional uh, challenges or headaches if you don't do it right. So the best way uh, to minimize the challenges is to create a standard uh, and a guidelines for running websites, managing the websites as a company and enforce it to the local team or agencies. Um, when you don't do that, uh, you know, the, each local team might be doing a, some, whatever they want. Uh, and then as it shows here, uh, it, it's an example of the simple things like URL structures. Uh, people in, or the each team, local team, might be doing what they want. Uh, as you can see, the, some uh, local sites are using uh, subdomains uh, instead of the www, um, and uh, some sites are on HTTPS, but not all of them and uh, some uh, sites are uh, ending with the ASPX, some might be uh, ending at the language uh, directories of the URLs. So, uh, you know, like I said, that uh, this will create so much uh, problem when you do the, uh, the geo-targeting or automate anything uh, within your companies. So um, there are ways to save um, some cost of running or managing the multiple uh, websites. One way is to uh, optimize the templates uh, once at the headquarters site. And then once that you have the uh, perfectly optimized templates, you just let the, all the local team or local websites uh, use that template so that they don't have to uh, optimize those templates again at each location. And also um, some, you know, if you create the standards and the guidelines, uh, you really need to make sure um, that everybody follows it. This is an example uh, of the templates of the company uh, might be using the same CMS, but as you can see here, um, the, some country is using, uh, US is using uh, uh, version 16, uh, the, the Japan is using uh, version 15J. It's, it looks like Japan has modified the, not just using, uh, still using the version 15, but they modified uh, the template uh, for their convenience. So again, uh, once you create the templates or whatever the uh, things for people to use, it is important uh, for them to use at the same time all the time. Uh, if you have the release of the new templates, make sure everybody uh, move on to the new one at the same time. And then if some local team like Japan on uh, the template versions case, uh, if it, you find any of the local team started to making changes of, on their own, understand why they're doing that so you can accommodate their needs in the future uh, changes. And then all of these, um, you know, the temp managing uh, the templates and uh, other uh, things goes into the website. Uh, could say, you know, might seems like a, a lot of the work, 
but if you do it right, you could save a lot of the money. So at the one company, uh, they saved more than $150,000 by eliminating the needs for uh, each local market or the local sites to do that SEO audits. And then another uh, were able to save uh, a lot of the money again by eliminating the needs for hiring uh, uh, local agencies at the each countries. So by headquarter find funding the dev team, they could create modules for all markets, and then, which is very helpful because a lot of the time, the local teams, a lot size of the local teams is a lot smaller than the headquarter. Uh, so whatever you can do centralized, and then uh, you know you manage that on the headquarters site and uh, eliminate needs for duplicate work at the each location. So along with that centralized development, another thing we find works is this center of excellence. Now it sounds like a big lofty MBA-ish term, but you can do it relatively simple, you know, by having uniform KPIs. Um, what is it that we should track across the markets? Even sharing this presentation with the different markets is something that they have uh, that they may not have had before. Force multipliers like the templates allow these to scale across the markets. And again, as Motoko said, infrastructure enhancement, enforce that. Make sure that they're using the latest templates. Because if you've made all these great SEO changes, you've fixed these canonical problems, if they're not using the template that contains them, um, then they're never going to reach those benefits. And that's why we also see a lot of this divergence across markets. Another thing you can do is, is create what are we going to do in, in central or local. Um, a lot of things here you can look at later, but but what's what are you going to do for them in a central market versus a local market? So if you can break that down, it, it just starts to show people what's possible uh, and either releases funding to do it in the different markets or may get corporate to, uh, to help out with that. Or it's something that can be centralized um, that helps with scale and efficiency. Another big one that I've always used is this idea of always on or making sure your critical keywords are always measured. Um, one of these is that this we you know have a set of words that yes between the different French language or German markets they're slightly different but things that are the same uh, we try to measure it. So in each market we can actually see uh, this keyword group performance. And this is one of the things that if you're not doing this today, you should try to do it. And if you've got a set of keywords that are the same uh, across each market, this helps you find anomalies. So one, most of the markets have 366 words that they care the most about. Uh, and we see Brazil as 411. Why do they have more? Do they have different products? Are they tracking things differently? And, and more importantly, why does Italy only have 42? Is it because they don't have the full product portfolio there? But if everybody has pretty much everything, it's a great way at a glance to understand how you're performing. In this particular case, for the words that have been deemed most critical, the essence of their business, the most they're there is about 30% of the time when people look for it. So this is an interesting stat that changes once you fix templates and, and all the pages across all the world start to benefit. So wrapping up, there was the three big things we wanted you to take away. As you saw, focusing on the searcher, as Motoko talked about, you know, finding the words that they use. Uh, attention to detail, making sure we're not making some of these mistakes with incorrect canonicals. I mean, we're seeing people suggesting you canonical everything back to the home page when you're using href language, which is not true. It's not right. So read it, give it a sniff test, make sure that it makes sense for your particular business. And then lastly, you know, work as a team. Uh, how can we combine things? If you're doing something in the UK and you start marketing in South Africa, maybe you can share those keywords. Uh, those type of things where you can share things across markets go a very long way and create your own little center of excellence. Do a webinar, do anything with internally uh, to help people and all these are ways that you can benefit your local markets. So I think it's time for Q&A. Uh, I think Brent's going to walk us through that. So we welcome your questions and, and uh, thank you in advance before we get to the end.
Awesome, awesome, awesome information, man. There's just so much stuff that was covered right there and so many things that, you know, have to be paid attention to. I, we have tons of questions. I mean, the, the question stream has been flowing in. Uh, before we dive into q and I did want to just give a quick shout out to our next webinar, which is coming up on May 23rd at 2 p.m. Uh, it's going to be with Larry Kim, who's the CEO of Mobile Monkey, um, and he is going to be talking about the top 10 Facebook messenger marketing hacks of all time. Uh, Larry's always fun to watch, uh, very, very smart, very interesting. So definitely uh, uh, suggest, you know, registering for that. Um, but diving into international SEO, let's look at some of these questions and bear with me because most of these questions are written in like multiple paragraph format. <laughs> They're very distinct questions. Um, I do want to um, just kind of jump in. Uh, with with one question uh, that I had that I think is one that I think is very important right now, and that's what is your view on utilizing local TLDs versus creating regional pages off of a dot com? I hmm. well, so the regional is the thing that's sort of throwing me. Regional means you're covering, trying to cover all of, say, Latin America commonly referred to as LATAM with so, a single site. Is that what you mean? Say, let's say let's say you have a dot com for like Amazon.com and then you have an Amazon.co.uk, right? So you're obviously in the UK you're getting the TLD, but if you were to try to do like an Amazon.com slash UK mm -hmm. or slash Germany or slash Japan or so not regional but country by country, people are trying to make these, you know, language pages, these regional, I mean these international pages uh, would you recommend getting a TLD in that country? Uh, does it still have an impact? What's your view on that? So yes, it's a two-part answer. Part one is if you can afford it and you can manage it, uh, absolutely positively do it. I think if you can afford the domain, you should, no matter what your web strategy is, you should have it. Um, we've seen a lot of people have to spend a lot of money to get a domain in another market in the future. Um, you will need it for local marketing. So Amazon.co.uk is what they use in, in offline and, and print and things like that. So absolutely, it, it is still a benefit. It is still one of the strongest signals uh, to the search engines. Now, that being said, on an enterprise level or even on a small person level, the CMS management, the web manager, this makes it in some cases cost prohibitive. It's easy to buy the domain, but managing the web infrastructure across top level domains can get expensive. If you don't have those resources, you can use uh, a country language combination. You can use either global English, you can use the UK slash EN, which is the common for, for the UK. If you do that, if you don't use a top level domain, you must use some form of geotargeting. If we're talking about Google, you can go in and set the geotargeting within your search console, uh, make your slash UK slash EN version or slash UK version actually equal to the UK. Be careful because um, that sometimes people confuse uh, UK with the Ukraine. Um, so, but yes, you can, but you do need that. I would suggest using href language uh, because Google, again, doesn't know what your folder is. Um, so definitely if you can't afford it and operationally it's a pain, uh, you can get by uh, with some good geotargeting and using a .com and a country designator in a folder. I'm not a big fan of subdomains because it's hard to unravel it later. Uh, so I would definitely use the subdirectory uh, directory and or language to designate these alternative versions. So I have seen the use of uh, some people using uh, WordPress multi-language, WPML for WordPress, mm -hmm. and that allows you to basically take one site, spawn a page for every single you know, country that you pick, and then you have to go in and edit each one of those pages and make it localized for that region. Sure. But it does allow you to put in all the different TLDs uh, for that. Is that something you've ever worked with or used? Does that work on other platforms where they allow you to kind of put in the TLDs and have a master file, but then, you know, customize each of the individual pages after the fact? Actually, most of the bigger, like in AEM and Sitecore and the sort of enterprise grade tools, 
typically you're still structuring it by country, but then you're using sort of a, a redirection scheme to push people out to the top level domain. So it's not like, a, you know, WordPress was designed for ease of use where you can centrally manage it. Uh, so if you're on a WordPress side, then that makes things a lot easier because WordPress is doing the heavy lifting for you. But as you start moving up into the the more enterprise grade tools, even some of the lot of the e-commerce systems, it, it becomes a challenge. So if you're using these, um, that's the first question you want to ask. And I think to Motoko's point about organization, what is your strategy? Now, when you launch your little, you know, back bedroom website today and you know, three years from now, you've got a multinational business. You probably didn't think about your domain strategy, uh, but but start thinking about it. Once you start getting bigger, how do we want to clone this and go? But but that works well. And if you can set it to where it replicates it, um, that gets back to the attention to detail. Does it adequately map content correctly across CCTLDs as well as mapping it across? across uh, if you're using country language um, folders or I'd stay away from parameters which is what some of these other tools do uh, but but yeah that will totally work for you one thing is to add to the, the CCTLD discussion is that if you have you know you want to save money and it definitely uh, all the market you are going after is Google as the main search engines, um, then definitely uh, that makes things easier to just use the, the language or country directory within the URL structure. That, that should work really well, especially with the HLF language uh, that we can use now uh, to tell Google which site is for which country, but uh, if the country like China or Russia is a really important market for you, um, you probably want to get .ru or .cm uh, local domain, even just for those countries. Uh, the China seems to be getting really, really uh, strict about website uh, having that uh, the, the CN domain and uh, Baidu is uh, aligning the, their algorithm to go with the regulation. So if you don't have the, the local domain for China, it's going to be uh, you know, harder and harder for you to rank well uh, on, in the Baidu search results. Is there a way to find out? That's an interesting point I never thought about. Uh, other countries' restrictions to their own search engines, right, or their own adoption of a search engine, right, because of the different rules that they might have. Is there a way of knowing that? Like, is that something that, you know, you just have to know, you guys happen to know because of your experience, or is there like a resource that tells some of the, the various different limitations out there? Um, Bill knows a lot more than I do, but as far as the China goes, they usually the government usually puts out those documents uh, on the updated regulation on the digital uh, the content. So uh, if you pay attention to that, or I'm sure if something like that comes out, someone will write on a blog or something too. But uh, I usually follow up on those government release on the new regulations. Just like, you know, in the States, people uh, follow up on the Google's, you know, the guidelines and stuff. Uh, so it's the same way. Wow, yeah, I've not really seen impressive. anybody, you know, a grid that says this market do this. But when you're going after your domain, the harder it is to get the domain, the more likely there are restrictions. So, for example, you know, to get you know, a true top level domain in Japan, you have to have an officer in Japan. You can get a .jp um, without any, you know, major, but if you want the .co, the proper corporate, you know, uh, official one, then somebody has to be responsible. And there's a lot of markets that still have that. You need an officer in country. Um, so the more restrictive they are like that, um, the more likely you're going to need to do something unique to that market. You know, most people are focused on the G8, the G20, so we don't encounter this as much. But, you know, China has the, you know, the great firewall. They're, they've got restrictions, what you can have. Not only do you, with a .cn, you have to have your registration number. We've seen people drop out of Baidu because they took the registration number off in a redesign. Uh, so Baidu won't index any .cn that doesn't have the company's registration number uh, physically on, on the page. 
uh, on the homepage. And so these are little things that, yeah, they're more nuanced, but the more aggressive or the more, I guess, out there a market you're going after, the more likely you're going to encounter. But I think it's a great resource to try to break that down. Uh, you know, what are some of the top level requirements, at least the gotcha countries. Uh, so that's a great idea. Very interesting, very interesting. So we did talk a little bit about href tags, um, and I and I have uh, a question here from an individual I'm going to read. So uh, in February, uh, you know, 27th, Google Search Console showed a 90% decrease in number of href lang tags for our U.S. site. We experiment experience drops around that time for other regional sites, but not to that extent. Our organic traffic remained constant. Do you think the loss in href lang tags is a problem? If so, any thoughts on why it happened and how to remedy it? So lost them. So if they didn't recognize them, the number one thing it usually is, so the question is, is it on a page or was it an XML sitemap? So if it's on the page, uh, it typically means Google didn't couldn't get to the page. Now, if you didn't experience a traffic loss, that means they did get to the page, which tells me it's probably an XML sitemap that they're not able to read. If the sitemap is not being read, and if you just open up Search Console and look at the errors for US specifically, your href XML, if the errors are pretty high, like more than two, three percent of the files, uh, the URLs in the file, there's your problem. Now, you're probably not seeing it in the U.S., uh, but you might be seeing because the U.S. is not mapped, it can now be sort of a rogue site, if you will. So what I would do, the check I would actually do is go to your markets, and like I suggested, uh, look at a rank report and see if now, because the U.S. is not being mapped technically uh, in your with the HREF, it could start to show up in other markets. Uh, it may not be affecting you here, uh, in the U.S. if you're in the U.S., but but definitely to see if the U.S. pages or global pages um, are starting to encroach into the other markets again. Uh, but yeah, it'd be an interesting thing to see. Check your errors in your file. Uh, if that's not it then and you don't have any problems around the world, then uh, you probably didn't have a big problem with href before you started. So I wouldn't sweat about it until it started affecting other markets if it's not affecting your traffic in the US. Awesome. Uh, one of the things that we have mentioned numerous times is there's a lot of technical things that you can do, but there's also some business practice things, and that's utilizing proper local language, terminology. You know, some people might reference something differently when they're shopping for it or when they're referencing, you know, the word in a different way. Um, if I'm a company and I need to launch four or five country specific sites, it seems I don't know where to begin for finding the natural language speakers. Are you looking, do, should people be looking for an agency? Should they be going out to the local Craigslists of the countries and trying to find natural language speakers? How, what would you suggest as kind of like a best practice for ensuring that you're getting the proper translations, you're getting the proper language from different regions or different countries? I, I would say that, well, there are many reputable localization agencies, translation agencies you can find, um, you know, in a, each language, especially the uh, major language that most um, American or European com companies uh, are going after. And, uh, you know, definitely do the background check and uh, if you have the in-house or if you have the, let's say, you know, the local office or even uh, the uh, partner companies in uh, those, you know, the countries that, that you want to create a website now, um, you know, ask them to help uh, to review that translation or uh, making sure that the, the right word is used in the right places. Even the word like the price, you know, if you have the e-commerce site, the word price, just having that one word, right word in there on the multiple your product page is very important. Uh, so you, you might not need to do the whole, you know, website review um, by them, but uh, some of those key 
words, you know, key terminologies that are uh, important to your business, definitely have your, you know, those business partners, local office, uh, someone to uh, look at that. And another thing I usually um, suggest many companies is that before you go uh, into that localization or translation work, uh, do the keyword research on yourself, you know, with the help with the local team or someone uh, by yourself, and then uh, send those keywords, you know, 20, 50, or 100, whatever it might be, um, to the, you know, give that to a localization agency or the company or a person who are going to translate your websites. Uh, ask them to use those words in those places. Uh, that way you know at least those words that are very important to your business are, you know, translated correctly. So, did Bill, did you want to comment or do you want well, to? Well, I was going to say, you know, how are you going to handle customer support? You know, if people start emailing you and calling you and saying, where's my order or do you do this or can I do this or can it do X? Um, you know, the same thing as Motoko said, who who would you reach out to to help with that? One other thing we're seeing some people do, and I'm not completely advocating it, but it's interesting, is a level of crowdsourcing of sort of that verification. As Motoko said, once you get it localized, whether it's, you know, whomever did it, um, you can actually offer incentives to people, maybe a frequent customer in that market to come in and take a look and give you suggestions. Uh, you know, obviously give them a discount or some free merchandise or that, but incentivize people, you know, who are natives in that market, who are people that, that are used to e-commerce. Because we see a lot where people translate stuff, but they don't really understand the web or digital. So those would be some things that I would add to that as well. Very interesting, very interesting. So you mentioned, uh, you know, having the issue where you go to a site and depending on the region you are in, you get redirected to a, a language version of that site. Um, I've had issues where it's driven, you know, PayPal is a great example of that. PayPal will force you into, you know, a certain country and no matter what, you can't seem to get in. So I'm forced to log in, you know, in a foreign country and try to figure, you know, language and try to figure out the menu structures and, you know, is 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 this something that people should avoid doing? I mean, is there? Would you say that don't make people, you know, go to certain pages, or if they, you know, type it in and they've returned? How do people solve that loop issue if they're looking at at building right. multiple language pages? I mean, there's some valid reasons to do it. There's contractual reasons. There's market reasons. There's you know, it's like there's reasons you have to do it. So when you do do it, I think to your point, what's the relief valve? You know, so if you send me like when we were just in Munich and, you know, if we get sent to PayPal, you know, the German version of PayPal and that's not working for us, give me the ability through the navigation to get back to the English version. A lot of people trap you. And, and that's the problem is they don't think through from a user perspective. You know, let me choose that I want English. You know, good customer service centric sites let us do that. Let me choose, I want at least give me the German site in English uh, or let me go back to the US. And, and uh, at least that's why I said check and see what happens. So that's the easiest way is to let people then go get what they want. Uh, if you absolutely positively must do IP, uh, redirecting and selection. Most people don't need to do it. They do it because some UX person said it was cool and what, you know, the cool sites do. Um, but think about if there's a business need for it, uh, but what's the out, you know, what's the relief valve? How do I, if I got to the wrong page, how do I get to the right one that I need to see? Uh, because that's a good use of customer experience versus trapping me in something I can't understand. Awesome. I, I think that we're kind of at the end of our time right now. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, say thank you. I mean, this is, there's, I, I have so many notes written here. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to follow up with you afterwards and ask you some more questions myself. Uh, you know, anybody who had questions, there was a lot of questions in here and some of them didn't get answered. Um, I highly recommend you reach out to, to Bill and Matoko. Uh, you know, they're both readily available. Um, you know, they're, they're, we'll make 
make sure that their information is out there for you. Uh, but I highly suggest reaching out to them, continuing this conversation. Um, you know, just you know, some of the answers alone have, have taught me that this is really an in-depth area that to requires somebody with some experience and expertise to really do this well. So uh, I definitely encourage reaching out to both of them. I really appreciate both of you coming on here and sharing this information. Uh, we had posted both of your author pro profiles in the chat dialog earlier as you continue to write about these topics. Uh, you know, I highly encourage people to follow those profiles and to catch your articles as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us.